Lucas Litzinger. He's a full-time game designer for Fantasy Flight Games. And he's the lead designer for Destiny. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff here, but he can, he's fine. <laughs> that, that, it's the most important. Yeah. So uh, then we have uh, Corey Kaneska, and he's been designing games at Fantasy Flight for over 10 years and is now head of the game design department. <laughs> then we've got uh, Timothy Zahn, and... Uh, <laughs> I guess that means you don't need an introduction, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have Mark Wade. <laughs> I guess you don't need an introduction either. I guess not. <laughs> so the first question I want to ask is, is for each of you. I think we're all here because of Star Wars. Uh, what was your first... Uh, what, what, when did you first become a creative working in the Star Wars universe for, for, for everyone here listening? We can start down at that end of the table. When did you get to, to w wade into the waters of Star Wars? Yeah, so uh, Star Wars Destiny was my first foray into Star Wars as a creative, and so uh, it's a pretty exciting project to be a part of, and uh, I feel really lucky to have been put in the position where I could work on such an exciting game and such an exciting property, but I've been working for Fantasy Flight Games for six years now, and uh, I worked on a lot of uh, collectible games, well, customizable games, and uh, even board games, and so it was really, really cool to be able to kind of jump onto a project as a lead uh, in the Star Wars universe. But uh, I started at FFG kind of after college, and uh, I've just been making games ever since, and so I was kind of in the right place at the right time. And what about you, Corey? Yeah, I think the first Star Wars game I, I worked on was probably helping out a little bit with X-Wing. Um, I think some people here might play that game. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I did a lot of work uh, co-designing Imperial Assault with, uh, with a team of guys around the office and also worked on more recently uh, Star Wars Rebellion, which came out last year. Um, and then helped out with uh, Destiny a little bit with Lucas. So I got gotten to play around with the world a little bit. It's fun. Tim, you've had a long time to play in the universe. Yep. Um, back in 1989, early November, <coughs> excuse me, uh, got an out of the blue phone call from my agent telling me that Bantam Books and Lucasfilm had made an agreement to do three more Star Wars books, picking up after Return of the Jedi, which was an era nobody had been allowed to write in before. Uh, and they're offering the project to you. Are you interested? <laughs> <laughs> was I? Are you? <laughs> I, I think. You, I think. And you. I mean, you've written how many Star Wars books now? Uh, I'm working on my eleventh. Uh, I've done ten, and uh, Thrawn is scheduled to come out next April. <laughs> Mark, you've done some great comics work in Star Wars. How did that happen? Thank you. Like I can top that story. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't choose where everyone sat. Yeah, thanks. Just, yeah. uh, I've been writing for Marvel Comics for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, when they got the comics franchise, uh, everyone, it was like a sword fight. Everybody at Marvel wanted to work on those books. Uh, and I was lucky enough, as they were casting for the spinoff books right off the bat, to be offered Princess Leia, which was a little later. It was a couple of months into the launch. And I was really excited about it because he, if I could, I could not have chosen a character that I, out of the blue, that I wanted to write more than Leia. Uh, so it was the perfect fit for me. Um, is, Star Wars is one of those things, sort of culturally, we all sort of know where we were in the moment that we first experienced it. And I'm wondering from each of you, um, what that first experience watching Star Wars or experiencing Star Wars was like, and how, and, and, and I want to ask another question about that afterward, after we get everybody's answers. And I don't know, if you, if you want to start, Mark, you, you said you've got a great story here. All right, here we we'll go. Give them something to talk. All right, so I'm old enough to have been there at ground level when the first movie came out. Now, this is the summer of 1977, and uh, I'm 15, 14, 15, and we have uh, some friends who are old enough to drive, so we always get together on Saturday night, and, we're, and we always see a movie. And this Saturday, we are all excited to see a movie, we, but we can't decide which one 
and they're arguing back and forth and finally I just yelled and I just said stop stop right here I know you all want to see this movie or that movie but there's this one amazing movie that I've been waiting to see all summer long and I can't wait and I promise you you'll have a great time and this is the movie we're gonna see damn it and we went to see it and that movie was you light up my life <laughs> starring Dee Dee Khan and Ron Silver when the lights came up it was very uncomfortable <laughs> My friends left me at the theater and I had to call my mom for a ride home. <laughs> Luckily, next weekend, cooler heads prevailed and I saw the movie. So. <laughs> and they never trusted your, your ever, movie taste again. Ever, ever. Tim? Sure, I never saw you light up my life. Sorry. <laughs> um, I don't think anybody else did either. Yeah, very possible. <laughs> You've missed nothing. <laughs> I've been a fan of Star Wars since about 30 seconds into the movie, which I also saw in the theater. The second night, I was busy the first night. We pan down to the planet. Here comes this ship, it's being shot at. Here comes the pursuer. Comes the pursuer, keeps coming. <laughs> By the time that Star Destroyer finished going over the screen, I knew I was gonna like this movie. It was the first time I'd ever had a real sense of size in a movie. And I thought, okay, these guys know what they're doing. And they did. Corey? Yeah, I might have been a little bit younger when I first saw Star Wars. Um... Get off my lawn. <laughs> Space lawn. I, I have very blurry pictures of Star Wars growing up. And the earliest one that I remember was actually at at the, uh, the library down the street from us when we were kids used to show movies outside on, on the screen. And I remember going there one evening and, and I just seeing like bits and pieces of it and seeing characters in Star Wars. And, and after that, I was just like more interested in it and asking my parents to watch it. And it was, I don't know, it, it, was, it was something that existed since I was born. And so it's kind of become a part of my DNA. My uh, introduction to Star Wars was actually while I was playing like T-ball, I was like five or six, uh, people would call me Luke, and so my coach, uh, when he met me, was like, oh, Luke, I am your father. I'm like, what the, I'm like, no you're not. <laughs> I'm like, what is this guy, I'm like, I don't, okay, whatever, that's weird. And. Uh, I didn't even have any idea what he was referencing, and it wasn't until I was like uh, a couple years later, eight or nine, and uh, I borrowed some ratty VHSs from my cousin with Star Wars that I actually put the two together, and I'm like, oh my god. Like, he quoted the line wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's no, I am your father. Oh. So, um, obviously, since you've all worked on Star Wars professionally, and, and you had no inkling that you would be doing so the first time you saw it, or the first time you experienced it, and were, were able to sort of take it in as a bystander in the culture like everyone else, how did your approach to Star Wars itself change when you started having to make creative decisions in that world? Do you want to start, Lucas? Yeah. Uh, so... It's really exciting to work in, a, you know, with a property like Star Wars, and my appreciation for it actually deepened, I think, a lot when I started kind of diving into it and beginning to think of it as a game designer versus just as a fan. And one thing you kind of realize is that, you know, Star Wars has everything you would ever want. Like, you know, it's got the ships, it's got the awesome characters, it's got these really fantastic weapons and storylines and you know there's really no sort of game like role-playing game card game board game that you might want to make that you can't make in this universe like it is a full-fledged universe with super iconic characters and so you know just kind of thinking about how i wanted to translate those into destiny uh was was really fun because like the hardest part about figuring out what to make like Han Solo's ability was figuring out like what part of that character to represent for that card because he's such a deep character. And so kind of this was the challenge for every character. It's like I can think of five or six abilities just like off the top of my head. And so it was really, really easy to kind of work with the Star Wars universe and uh, it, it was a blast. 
Corey? Sure. I mean, I remember growing up as a kid, like just making our own Star Wars games. Like we'd have like a piece of paper and draw a grid and make up some stuff. And like, as as long as I remember, that's kind of that, that's what playing is. As a child, it's taking your action figures and making up a story and deciding what you're what you're trying to do and competing with your brother and all those sorts of things. And so. Working, working at FFG and getting to work on these real games is kind of just like tapping into that that childhood and saying like, what are those, what are those experiences and what are those things that that we were imagining and that we we were doing and, and putting some structure to it and creating something that that is actually a, a product and a real physical game that other people can enjoy too. I'm not sure this is entirely an answer, but it. What impressed me most after about the first eight or nine times I'd seen Star Wars <clears throat> and then subsequent viewings of the, the rest of the classic trilogy was how real the world felt and the little details that make it feel real. Like this is something people would actually build, this is something, you know, how things would actually work. Uh, my favorite example, <clears throat> excuse me, is in Empire Strikes Back at the end Luke is hanging under Cloud City. Uh, Lando and the, uh, we brought the Falcon underneath. Lando goes up to the top hatch to get him. Question for all of you geeks, and just raise, raise of hands if you know, what does Lando do to open that hatch? Hmm? Anybody? You, yeah. He attaches his safety line to the ring. This is called a safety interlock, and this is how you design things in the real world. If you're off the ground, you can't open that hatch until your safety, lock, your safety line is engaged. Little things like that that you don't even notice the first time, but it gives you the sense of this is something real. And that's something we always have to do in a novel or a short story or a comic or a game, is to give this sense of this is how a real world would operate. Mark? I think for me, you know, by the time I, well, first off, you know, I, I love the franchise too after that second weekend in the movie theater um, <laughs> and had grown up with it and loved it dearly. By the time I got to it as a creative, it was 40 years old as a franchise. That made it very daunting, very intimidating to me in trying to find what worked for me, what, what I could tap into. And ultimately what I tapped into, what I, what I, how I approached it was that it is a very optimistic universe. Yes, bad things happen. Yes, horrible people are around, but it is basically an optimistic universe, and that is how I write as a general rule. I have no use for cynicism as a writer. Uh, I, I, I think we have a moral imperative to try to bring light to things, uh, shed light on things as writers, and, and, it's, and to bask in, and remind people that we are ultimately good people. Uh, and so that's what I tapped into, and that, that really felt like I could, I could sell that in that comic. So I want to ask some questions of, of each of you individually, but uh, if, if any of the rest of you have answers, please jump in if, if they relate. But I want to start with Lucas. Um, how has gaming outside of Star Wars informed your experience with Star Wars and, and working in it and playing games there and just kind of like living in that universe? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's interesting how like games are universal. Like I I think Timothy brought up a good point. Like Star Wars feels real because of the details, you know, in the movies and in the comics and in the novels. And you know, you can even think of uh, the scene where Chewbacca is playing, you know, the, their kind of futuristic version of chess. And like, you know, that gaming exists in the Star Wars universe, and obviously gaming exists outside of the Star Wars universe, and it's such a universal experience for everyone, and it kind of uh, is just a way for some people to pass the time, for other people like uh, myself, you know, it's both a way to pass the time and it's kind of my job. Uh, but, but I think uh, uh, gaming as a whole uh, is a fantastic way, especially tabletop gaming, to kind of bring people together and to kind of, you know, just be able to communicate with each other and, and to, 
I suppose, you know, kind of play what if scenarios and the game hopefully doesn't play out the same way every time. And in Star Wars there are a lot of like what if scenarios that could happen. Like what if Luke doesn't get rescued under Cloud City? You know, what if he does decide to turn to the dark side? And so while you won't be able to experience all of those in Destiny, you will be able to experience some of the what if scenarios because one of the really exciting things about the game is that you can put characters from all of these different eras and all of these different cards and stuff together kind of play out your own Star Wars Destiny battles. And uh, that's something that's, that's pretty exciting and that's something that I, I really like about the game. So, um, unless any of you had anything to add to that, Mark, I'd like to ask you, sure. you've done a lot of work in comics mm -hmm. and obviously that's sort of a different medium than Star Wars is, uh, sort of, that it, it's not as well known as comics as it is as a movie. Right. But what did you bring from your experience in comics to the Star Wars universe? That's a good question. I mean, a, a lot of it was bringing characterization, bringing, making, because again, especially in a comic, you can't have you can't have a comic without characterization, without strong characters, because then it's just dull. And then it's just stuff blowing up and people punching each other. Uh, but I was also able to bring from comics a real strong sense of, of the visual. And that's where my, my cohort, Terry Dodson, the artist, uh, really homered it. I mean, really hit it over the fence with all of those comics. Uh, that's, I mean, that's really what I brought, what comics brought to it. Yeah, no, I, there's definitely things in there that, that I don't think you could have done in the movies, like that, uh, that moment where Queen Amidala's stained glass yeah. sort of turns to Leia. That's the thing. You always have to look, if you're doing transmedia stuff, if you're doing one medium as opposed to another medium, you have to look for the things that only that medium can do. Um, moving to, to Corey, you've worked on a lot of fantasy flight games in the Star Wars universe, and... They're all very different, whether that's X-Wing or Rebellion or Armada or Destiny or even, uh, you know, there's, there's just a lot there. How do you approach coming to each of these different corners of the gaming universe from Star Wars? How do you pull out different aspects of the saga? Well, I think with, uh, with, with all the Star Wars games that we've made as Fantasy Flight, we're, we're trying to relay a different experience and give players a, a different corner of the universe to play around with. Like with, uh, with Imperial Assault, for example, that's a game that's about everybody controlling a character and having a campaign and growing your character over time, almost like a, a board game, role-playing game hybrid. And, and that's, that's a game that I've always dreamed to have exist in the Star Wars universe. And, and we had the opportunity to say, you know what, this is, this is a popular category of games. What would that sort of game be like in Star Wars? And so really pulling out the, the best parts of Star Wars that fit there and the best parts of those sorts of games and, and mashing them together. And I think, I think that's what it comes down to is like finding like what, what, what sort of experience do we want to have in each of these? And I think the similarity between them is always the characters. Like in, in Star Wars, it's, it's about the... The name characters, you've got your Vaders and your Lukes and you've got your, your minor characters, but it's all about what their motivations are, what they're trying to do, what, what their personalities are and finding a way to kind of pull that through because that, that can sometimes even transcend the events that are happening. And in, uh, in Star Wars Rebellion, for example, which is a big giant galaxy spanning war game to some people, even in that, the focus is still about who do you own, what, what characters do you have, and, and what missions are you sending them on? And with Destiny, we really have the ability to focus even deeper on that, let you choose your favorite characters from anywhere throughout the saga, match them together and see like, who would win between Boba Fett and... Count Dooku. Count Dooku. <laughs> well, it depends. Is Count Dooku blind and does he have a stick? Uh, I think he has a lightsaber, yeah. So, <clears throat> this is, no contest. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tim, I'd like to ask you, since this sort of straddles a line between games and uh, creating stories, when you were working on the Thrawn trilogy, uh, West End Games was sort of concurrently putting together supplemental material, and I'm wondering if you could talk about how that, how that worked as a relationship with you as a writer and them designing games at the same time, and, and what sort of... Uh, helpful things came out of that collaboration? 
Well, a lot of, I mean, we had a lot of the, uh, that they would do, take characters, put the, the game stats and everything. Uh, the most interesting thing that came out of that was with the last command. Um, I knew I was going to have a battle between Luke and uh, uh, Sabiath and such in the Emperor's throne room in Mount Tantus. So I contacted West End because I knew they were going to be making a source book for this. I said, can you have your artist work me up the throne room? So instead of inventing it myself and maybe putting catwalks or whatever where I could, where it would be useful, I will take something somebody else has done and choreograph my fight to that. So um, rather than getting to make it up as I go, the Indiana Jones approach we all, all know and love, I had to fit everything into a pre-existing battleground, which is how in the real world you would have to do it. So that was... Uh, that was probably the most unusual thing, but that was a lot of fun to do. Would Lucas, Corey, if, if one of the writers, like if Tim called you up and said like, hey, I need something, I know you're doing a supplement. I mean, you guys would probably accommodate that, right? You know, we definitely look at it. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a question uh, for, for all of you now. So you all work in Star Wars, but Star Wars is not the only place you work. What, what are the key differences in creating stories and experiences in the Star Wars universe versus sort of the other universes you like playing in? Mark, you want to start? Well, yeah. I mean, it's... Hmm. The Star Wars universe is much more well-defined, um, and it has its gatekeepers of continuity at Lucasfilm, which is terrific because they keep everything straight, um, and they make sure that everything is, you know... On point with continuity, with their continuity. Uh, other places I work, less so. Uh, and when I'm doing my own stuff, my own career, own stuff, then it's just it's up to me to define the rules. But I kind of like rules. That's the thing. I mean, as a writer, I like having. And you probably have this same thing. You like having something to push back against yeah. a little bit uh, because it it makes your it makes your stories better. It makes you have to work harder and think out and think through the things you're doing more. Yeah, just as I had to make my fight in that setup, we have to make our story within the larger framework of this is Star Wars. Uh, another advantage is I don't have to explain to people who Han Solo is. I don't have to you know, explain the character, develop the character for you know, where this starts and such. If I can get him 80% correct, the audience, the readers can fill in the other 20%. The flip side of that is if I don't get that 80%, it is not Han Solo, you know, this is not a Star Wars book, it's a story of two guys named Han and Luke and has nothing to do with Star Wars. So we, we do have to not only fit within the universe, but we've got to get the known characters correct. And what yeah, about in games? I, uh, I agree a lot with what Mark said about how having constraints when you're working creatively is actually a really good thing. And I think that a lot of people who, who dream about like making their own game or, or, or their own book or whatever think that, oh, it's, it's gonna be harder because there's going to be things in the way, but it, it actually doesn't tie your hands. It actually frees you and it directs you and it really kind of helps you mold your creation into something that can be better. Because you're going to have to have rules anyway, eventually, right. that make sense and are coherent. If you've got the pre, pre-made ones, it frees up that part of, of the process. Exactly, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, content creation is always a challenge sometimes when doing games. Like, you have to come up with sometimes a lot of uh, different, you know, weapons or cards or abilities. But, you know, when you work in a universe like Star Wars, like, it's already all there. And so you just have to find it, which is nice. Uh, also, I've never really been asked to be on a panel before for some of those other games I've worked on. So I'd say that's pretty different. <laughs> so, Mark, kind of following up a little bit, like, yeah. when you come into, say, Marvel or DC and they say, hey, you're doing Fantastic Four, is, are the continuity... Uh, do you have a freer hand with the continuity in places like that, where they're just like, hey, we're starting over, go ahead? I, I do, but at the same time, having read every comic book ever published, like I know where the lines are, and I know what the continuity is anyway, so e even if you give me a free hand, I'm probably going to play into that, I'm probably going to lean into that, because I like that. I like part of the fun of doing 
uh, company-owned comics like that, Fantastic Four, Avengers, or whatever, is walking away from it when you're done feeling like you added something to that franchise or that universe that they can't take away. There's stuff that I did for Superman that ended up in Man of Steel. And as much as I hate that movie... Um, <laughs> We don't blame you. It was still cool. There's stuff that when the Flash TV show was on, I see things that are mine, and I just and when they talk about the Speed Force, I just light up like a Christmas tree. So that's part of the fun of it to me. And then um, you, you've done a lot in other universes as well. How do other universes compare to Star Wars as far as the workflow and the, the creativity behind it? Is there an apparatus like Lucasfilms when you're working... Elsewhere? Generally speaking, the, the franchises I've worked in have been Terminator Salvation and the uh, recent Blizzard book, uh, StarCraft Evolution. And in both cases, I had people who were watching over what I did, you know, making sure everything stays in continuity, um, good people to work with both times. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you expect to have oversight on that. Um, and again, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have people who were good to work with and enjoyable to work with. Um, Lucas, I want to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you're the, the lead designer on Destiny, and you had the pick of every Star Wars character. How do you go about narrowing down that process for how you're going to pick characters that are going to be in a game, especially since everybody's eventually going to want all of the characters? Right. I mean, it, it got a little bit easier because, like, the first set has 24 characters. So if you're, like, if you're going to narrow down the entire Star Wars universe to 24 characters, that would be impossible. Like, that's really terrifying, and I wouldn't want to do it because then everybody will be upset that their favorite character didn't make it. However, it's only the first set, and so we will have a second set with 24 more characters and a third set with 24 more characters and hopefully a fourth and a fifth and a sixth and a seventh and an eighth and 24 characters in like all of those sets. And so eventually everyone will get their favorite character you'll in. You'll be able to have like a cantina set. That's right. You'll be able to go into the <laughs> cantina and you know, all of the scum and villainy of the entire universe is there in the game. Jack, uh, Jackson, the green ro rabbit's going to be there. Yes. Well, uh, give it enough sets. Oh, yeah. there, we, there we go. Uh, but as far as picking characters for the first set, we wanted to pick you know some of our favorite characters, some of the characters that we felt were very iconic, and then we also wanted to save some of the characters that we felt were iconic as well, so that when we get to those other sets, we still have a lot of exciting characters to reveal down the line. Who Oh, go ahead. And I think that uh, another important thing when we're looking at it was just um, choosing different types of characters. Like, you can only have so many people running around with red lightsabers, even as cool as they are in the same set. And so, like, choosing people that fulfill different sorts of roles and have different sorts of things they can do, I think, was pretty important. Who, who, were you, who did you try to include in this first set that you, that you had to put off that you're, you're just kind of itching to get back to? Uh, well, I, I mean, I think that Han shouldn't be flying solo for too long. So, watch out for that. Um, with uh, Mark, I want to ask you another question. And this is in dealing with characters, and especially characters with iconic looks. Right. You worked with, I, I would say, an iconic artist in bringing yeah. the Princess Leia comic to life. How does the relationship between an artist uh, and a comic book writer work in a world like Star Wars? In a war, I mean, it, it works pretty much the same as it does in other comics, which is that it's a very collaborative medium. Like, I write a script, and it, it's approved by Lucasfilms, but there is still the opportunity for an artist to come in and sort of shape it and pace it and, and sort of make it his own, and if there's a better idea, a better way of doing things visually, then it, you know, then that's fine. It's, it's not, I don't want an art robot. I want somebody who's telling a story the same as I am. Um, in, that case, in, in Terry's case specifically, we really lucked out because he draws great women. I don't just mean like cheesecake women. I mean women of all shapes and sizes, women of all... And they all have the best hair. And they all have the best hair. They all have amazing <laughs> hair. I'm not, I mean, like, that's not, I'm not being sarcastic. Like, no, the hair in that book hair. is incredible. But which played into what I was doing because if you paid attention to the comic, 90% of the characters are women. I really made an effort to make that happen because why not? It just it made more sense to me because there were not that enough comics and enough stories out there with women as their own having their own agendas and being the agents of their own fate. 
So Terry was a great fit. So, but, uh, yeah. oh. I'll ask later. No, go ahead. No. I was just going to ask a uh, yes. technical question. Do you put stage directions in your script or just the dialogue? No, stage directions every so time. So he knows what you... He knows, yeah, panel one, this happens. Panel two, this happens. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and, and this question would be for the two of you, because I don't imagine they're letting you two create new characters to, to bring in Destiny. Um, but wouldn't that be cool, though? That, that would yeah. be pretty cool. We're sticking to the established characters for Destiny. Um, when you're creating a character that's new, that's unique to you, um, you know, what's that like handing it over to someone else and seeing that character come to life? You know, with, with Yvonne... It's awesome. It's really awesome. You feel, again, it's back to this notion of you feel like you added something to the legacy that will outlast you, that will, that will be something that is some other people can pick up that baton and run with. So Yvonne showing up you know, in, in novels, of on showing up in games. That, that's awesome. That's, that's great. It, it is very exciting. It uh, uh, kind of affirms what you've been doing. Yeah. It can be, however, like sending your kid to daycare for the first time. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. you don't know. Yeah. So, <laughs> Corey, I'd like All to... parents understand this, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Corey, um... The Star Wars universe is, is obviously a huge place, and there's lots of books, and there's lots of comics, and there's lots of games supplementing all of that. Um, what were the biggest influences in your vision of what Star Wars and Star Wars games should be outside of the movies themselves? What were you drawing on? Well, I mean, it's, there's, there's two main things that I, I grew up beyond the movies of Star Wars really getting into, and the first one was the novels. I mean, the Heir to the Empire trilogy was like really one of the first big things that, that showed us that the universe was bigger and it was, it, it really inspired me. Um, and beyond that, like I also, there were, played a lot of the, uh, the Star Wars CCG, the original one, Decipher made back in the day and um, spent a lot of time playing that game and just experiencing kind of playing games collaboratively in the Star Wars universe with other people. I don't know, there's, there's just so much out there that can direct you and, and inspire you to do something. I found that the Cypher game um, had a lot of information about the characters and stuff on the cards, or even just not a lot of information, but you get that one sentence, and there's, there's sort of hints in the art and, and things like that when, when you worked on Destiny that you can see that kind of stuff, right? Sure, yeah. I mean, it's a it's another collectible card game, and we've, I mean, we've taken a lot of hints from a lot of other collectible games out there, but we've also tried to do something unique that is familiar but different. Well, I guess I mean the thing with Star Wars is that fans are always trying to play. Fans always want to know more, and they want to have that next step. And when they're telling these stories, whether that's in games or or whatever, it, it seems like Destiny really captured that. Yeah, I think I think Lucas um, did a lot to really kind of try to pull that out there, and and as well with our artists, I think, like really trying to capture those moments and that flavor and showing more. So, um, Tim, yeah, we're going to talk about Grand Admiral Thrawn a little bit. Inevitable. It's it's <laughs> completely inevitable. We're playing a long game here. Um, What's it been like seeing Thrawn grow? And I mean, you've written Thrawn a lot yeah. and, and, and almost exclusively, but uh, we're seeing him pop up elsewhere now. Mm -hmm. Tell me about what that's like. I mean, other than the daycare. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in that analogy, Thrawn has mostly been homeschooled. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's been very exciting, a little bit scary. Um, again, very affirming. This is a character I invented 25 years ago at the time. J just to put this in perspective, the reason it was a three book contract that Lucasfilm and Bantam set up was because nobody knew if anybody even cared about Star Wars anymore. This was the test run. We're gonna do three books. If they you know, die like dogs, then we're done with it. Um, whether Lucas would have gone on to make more movies, we don't know, but it would certainly have killed any publishing, uh, new publishing thing. So um, no one knew whether you guys were still out there. Thank you for being out there. So when I wrote them, okay, this is three books. 
hopefully they will do reasonably well. I'll move on with my life and, you know, things will go on. Uh, you, you always hope as a writer that one or more of your characters will capture the reader's you know, heart and soul, but you never know if you will. Uh, it's, it's always a surprise, it's always a, a wonderful surprise, and the fact that Grand Admiral Thrawn did capture the imagination of so many people was unexpected, uh, very gratifying, and now to have him in Rebels is, you know, even cherry on the, on, on the frosting, as it were. Uh, I, I enjoy, I'm very much enjoying what they're doing with the character. I'm looking forward to seeing you know, how they carry his story arc. Um, and unlike normal daycare, I trust these people. This is, <laughs> this is like sending your kid to your relatives that you've known for years and, and, and you trust them. So it's, it's just very exciting. Um, something I would never have anticipated 25 years ago. How would you feel about Thrawn showing up in a, in a game? Um, that would be very cool. Um, do, we have, do we have somebody over here with a... Oh. <clears throat> this is... <laughs> That's, that's, that's beautiful. <laughs> uh, so, okay, now I'm going to ask you, everybody, to close your eyes for about three minutes. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's not going to fit in your luggage, man. <laughs> he can I'll, ship I'll buy, it. I'll buy a new suitcase. I don't care. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. So, Thank you so much. I want to ask the details. When will Thrawn end up in the game, uh, officially? And what was it like? I mean, what's it like working with a character like Thrawn, and, and what's it like overseeing that daycare? Right. So, uh, so Thrawn will arrive in set three of Destiny. We haven't announced anything else about it, but it is coming, and we are working on it currently. And uh, it's really exciting to work with iconic characters, and he's obviously one of the most iconic characters uh, in Star Wars that hasn't appeared in like a major movie. And so, you know, we only have 24 character slots, but we're really excited to give one of those slots in set three to Thrawn. And so be prepared, he's coming, and it's going to be awesome. Wow. <laughs> So we've still got some time left, and I'd really love to take some questions from the audience. Does anyone have any questions for these panelists while you've got them up here? This is your chance. Yes, sir. No comment. <laughs> well, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Following up on that, how often do you get asked about Mara Jade? As far as continuing things or, or whatever? Oh, about as every time somebody th congratulates me on Thrawn coming into Rebels, the next breath is, is Mara Jade going to show up? <laughs> okay. We and I have no idea what they're doing. It, and, and even if he did, he wouldn't tell anyone. But I can honestly say they're not talking to me about anything. No, seriously. I, I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to tap dance around this one. On the other hand, bear in mind that up to about uh, 50 weeks ago, I also had no idea Thrawn was going to go uh, into Rebels, so these things do change sometimes. <laughs> Not that I'm expecting them to. We've got a question here, and then we'll go to the back. Um, for Lucas, um, so, like, at what point in the design process for Destiny was it decided upon like, the game um, versus um, uh, So, so the question for everybody, so everybody could hear, uh, at what point did they decide, determine, at what point did you determine it would, it would be a customizable card game and how did that affect the, the process? Yeah, so it was decided from the very beginning to be a collectible game, so we never thought about making it non-collectible or releasing it in any other format. Uh, the nice thing about the dice in the game is that we can print on them. Uh, the challenge there is that it's kind of expensive to do so, and so really the only way to get all of the dice that we wanted uh, into the game was to make it collectible, and also we felt like there is a 
big opportunity to have a collectible Star Wars game. This is a market that we just weren't really in, the collectible market. And we have other products for markets, you know, uh, that prefer a more uh, different distribution model already. And so really from the very beginning of the, of the design process, we knew it was collectible. And it didn't really affect the actual design of the game too much, obviously. It did affect like how many cards we would put into a set. Like we wanted larger sets than something like our living card games. Uh, and so that's why we have 160 cards per set. And then uh, uh, we also have Rarity, and Rarity is actually kind of a nice tool as a designer because you can actually take some cards that you might fear are a little bit complex or maybe difficult to understand, and you can kind of move them up the Rarity chain and still have you know common and uncommon cards that people can play. And so we didn't try to like make the legendary cards like better than any of the other cards. We tried to balance it as a complete set of 160 cards and then I actually assigned the rarity at the very end of the process. So I didn't know which cards would be legendary until I went in to the set at the very end and started assigning those rarities. So we had a question in the back. So uh, rotation is definitely something that we're currently discussing. We don't have any announcements on it right now, but uh, I'm sure we'll have something in the near future as far as that is concerned. And then uh, we're hoping to release uh, multiple sets a year. Hopefully three sets a year is the current idea. Yep, three sets a year. That's a good question. Uh, so the first question was, how long does it take a card to go from like early development into release? And it, it takes kind of a long time because the dice are actually very difficult to produce and so we have a long lead time on those. So, uh, you know, it'll take probably about 10, 10 months before we like finalize a set to, uh, you know, get into final production and actually have it in our warehouse. And so, you know, we started the game over a year ago and it's only coming out now. And so we work a little bit further ahead for this game than some of our other games. Uh, and then uh, as far as uh, the second part of the question, which was, I already forgot. Can you, can, uh, do you get access oh, to yeah, anything? Do you, access, know what, do you know what's right. coming down the pipe so you could be working on Rogue One right, stuff yeah. now? We are, we are able to work on stuff ahead of time uh, through Disney. They've been really good partners with us in getting us the information that we need for our future sets. So for, for all of you then, how tight are the NDAs they make you sign, the non-disclosure agreements? <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, they just, I, yeah. There, there is the Lucasfilm implant, though. It's, <laughs> it's been upgraded to the Disney one. That's a bigger model. <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. No, I, I, honestly, it hasn't affected us at all. Disney taking over, yeah, I, it hasn't, it hasn't. And except for the part where Han Solo has to wear Mickey Mouse ears, yes. I think yeah. <laughs> basically, yeah. And I think to answer yep. your question, George Lucas retired, so he's not, he, yep. the, Kath, Kathleen Kennedy is right, the, yeah. at the, the top of that company, but Lucasfilm is making all those decisions. Right. Disney's just bankrolling them. Yeah. Basically what they're doing with Marvel and Pixar as well. Yeah. They've, they've learned at Disney to let the creative people create and we'll just shovel money in their direction and take the dump truck of money they bring back to us. <laughs> <clears throat> hey, it works. Any other questions? Yes, here in the front. Um, seeing game design as a dream job, what would you say to someone that would aspire to follow their dreams? So the question, in, in case everybody couldn't hear, uh, 
game design is a dream job. How do you tell people to, how, what advice do you give to people who want to follow those dreams? I, I always recommend that people like first do it, first be a game designer just for a hobby. Like make your own games, play them with your friends, tr try it out and, and figure out what, what you like about it, gain experience, go to conventions, talk to people, learn about the industry and just kind of learn the ropes little by little. I mean, at, at FFG, like we, we post job listings every once in a while when we're looking for new designers and whatnot. But the thing that I always look at when I'm like reviewing resumes and whatnot is, is this, does this person actually have experience doing it? And it doesn't even have to be a sold product. It just has to be, are you passionate about it? And have you put in the time and effort to actually do this yourself? Has the, the switch in continuity from the old expanded universe to Legends affected your work on the new Thrawn book? Not, not so far it hasn't. Um, I've just gotten the, the list of rewrites requests from, from Lucasfilm, and it's about in the same range as I've had all the other books. You know, this doesn't work, uh, this, uh, this planet won't work here, this character needs some tweaking. So there hasn't been really anything, anything different. Um, and again, since it's all Lucasfilm and the established people are still the ones I've been working with in the past, um, I'm not expecting a lot of difference. The difference is that now, instead of just the Delray editor and the Lucasfilm editor looking over, over everything, the story group gets a, a crack at it as well. So rather than a two-headed editor, I've got a three-headed editor. Any other questions from the audience? <clears throat> Not, well, what would I like to work on? That's a good question. Um, I mean, everybody wants their hands on Han Solo. I mean, but that's taken care of right now. Um, I've, I've, I've been offered more Star Wars. I've basically been told it's an open door for me at Star Wars. Come in and do whatever you can, whenever you can. So I've probably got something coming up in later 2017, but we haven't settled on it yet, so I can't really talk about it. But thanks for asking. Um, as far as dream projects of Star Wars, whether that's a game or whether that's another book, if, if Lucasfilm called up and said, what's your favorite character and you get to design their favorite situation or the, you want to do the Battle of Tanab, go. You know, like how do you what, would you, what would each of you pick? Honestly, Princess Leia was it for me. Yeah. Like that was the story I wanted to tell the most with that character. Just so much, uh, so many possibilities. Uh, I would like to do that. We were discussing that earlier. Some uh, another uh, comic book uh, uh, artist had thought about the idea of Boba Fett's journey with Han back to Jabba, with every other bounty hunter coming out of the woodwork trying to steal him back. And uh, I pitched this to uh, one of the Lucasfilm people, and they said, "Sounds great. You can't do it." <laughs> <laughs> Because until we decide what we're doing with Boba Fett, Boba Fett is off limits. But we have hopes. Yeah. <laughs> I would just love to be able to make like a standalone game that was just based on Jar Jar Binks. That would that'd be <laughs> awesome. I would play that game. Walk into this. You know, I, I really like Corey's idea, but I think Jar Jar Binks is actually hunting Ewoks in the game. I think that's, that's his primary goal. Uh, I mean, for me, it's kind of nice with Destiny because, like, as long as I work on Destiny, like, I don't have to really pick favorites. Like, I just get to put everything in there, and so <laughs> everything is is kind of awesome. Yes, sir. Would I want to resurrect any of my characters from the Legends? Uh, all of them. Um, <laughs> it's. Right now, we've got Thrawn, so we'll, we'll be happy with that. If Thrawn does very well, we'll start nudging to uh, maybe get one or two other characters in. Talon card. Talon card <laughs> is, is, is fun. Uh, Mara Jade, obviously. 
Um, th there are there are other characters. If they let me go back and pick up some of my legends storylines and bring them into canon, there are there are two or three that I would pitch to them. But right now, we're we're happy. We're having Thrawn. We're happy with that. And it's a lot. I mean, oh yeah. And he's on the show now. He's been in three or four episodes now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thrawn has theme music. How? Yeah. <laughs> like, how is that? I asked you about this, and like, what? What's it like hearing Thrawn's theme music from a composer as talented as Kevin Kiner? I will be honest, there is still something about this that doesn't feel real. As if, no, I'm imagining this, right? This is, this is a dream. Um, is this really happening? So, um, yeah, a character with theme music, that is just one more level of coolness on top of all the other levels of coolness of this. Everyone just has an idea of you working on revisions with that looping in the background. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Yes, and then we'll go back to Matt, the radar technician. Matt. Uh, right now we are only looking at uh, canon characters for the game. If we decide that we are running low on characters for some reason, uh, around say, you know, 12, 13, 14, then maybe we'll have a discussion about it. But for now, we feel pretty happy with uh, canon characters. And then Matt, the radar technician. Again, I like what they're doing. People sometimes ask who I would cast as Thrawn or Mara Jade. The thing is, I don't see characters, my characters, in terms of face or, or voice. I see them as I'm writing in terms, terms of character, personality, how they would react to certain things. So typically anybody who could capture the essence of the character, I think could play the character just fine. That being said, I like their decision in Rebels to bring in a Danish actor so his voice is a little bit different than the King's English type of thing. I like the way they're doing gestures. But again, it's a character that's important to me. And watching him basically dissect Hera or you know, dis dissect her story. And, and, and I still think my favorite line of that episode was, please... You embarrass me in front of our host. He's got everything at this point, and that is the character of Grand Admiral Thrawn, and that's what I hope to see, and that's what we're seeing. So I'm, I'm very excited to see what else, what else they do with him. Did we have any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. You're my favorite person in the room right now. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, one more time? Yes, uh, yes, exactly. It's a, li it's a little bit of both. They want that connection, but they're also very picky about how you execute it. Because uh, I had a couple or three other nods here and there in the series, and they, they weren't keen on them, but that's okay. I mean, they, you know, it's their sandbox. Um, but no, thank you. That was, that was out of my head. Yeah. Thank you. So we had one more hand up here, and this is going to be the last question. Make it a good one. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, yes, future sets will be the same size as the first set. We won't release starters with every set, but uh, the actual set will be at least that large. Uh, it's possible sometimes in collectible games that you know you end up going one or two cards up or down, but we will shoot for 160 cards per set. So, um, 
we've got some stuff to raffle, but before we do the raffle, uh, I want to thank everybody on the panel here. You guys have been great, and this has been a really great conversation. And likewise, another hand for our moderator, if you wish. Yeah. I totally forgot to introduce myself, too. So in case you're all wondering, like, why is that guy on the stage? My name is Brian Young. I write for StarWars.com and Star Wars Insider, and I do the Full of Sith podcast. So uh, that's why they bothered to have me on the stage. Because <laughs> otherwise, they, they could have just taken care of this. They, they're great.